Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Chandler. I teach in the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University in the United States. I'd like to thank the National Library of Israel for inviting me to speak with you today. I thank you all for joining me. I hope that wherever you are, you're doing well at this time of multiple challenges. So my talk today is titled, Can a Language Have a Personality? On Anthropomorphizing Yiddish. And as I would like to uh, show you some things, I, I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. So this talk is based on a chapter of a book that I recently wrote. It was published in December. And uh, it is titled, as you can see here, Biography of a Language, Yiddish. And this book was commissioned by Oxford University Press uh, for a series that they have called Biography of a Language. And uh, the other books in the series offer a more conventional chronological overview of their respective languages. But I was inspired by the title of the series. Uh, and so I decided to organize this book on Yiddish by following the format of a biographical profile. So each of the book's 14 chapters offers a thematic approach to Yiddish under the rubric of a biographical heading. So starting with date and place of birth, and then family background, residence, name, gender, and so on, ending with life expectancy. I was drawn to this approach by reflecting on the notion of a language having a biography. Since a biography is conventionally about a person, a biography of a language approaches the language in question, at least nominally, as if it were a human being. That is, this approach anthropomorphizes its subject. And in fact, languages are often conceptualized in anthropomorphic terms. For example, when people speak of a language as being part of a family of languages, or when a language is characterized as dying. Anthropomorphizations of Yiddish are especially wide ranging. They can be very revealing as to how people have thought about Yiddish over the years, how they've scrutinized it, how they've conceptualized it, or how they've imagined it. And I argue that attention to this activity is key to understand the story of Yiddish, whether past, present, or future. Indeed, it's remarkable how often people have spoken about Yiddish as if it were a kind of person. They variously characterize the language as a mother, an orphan, a maidservant, a seductress, a deviant, a muse, a laborer, an invalid, a foreigner, a magician, even a ghost. Here are some more examples. These are all figures representing Yiddish as a kind of person uh, in cartoons that were published in the Geiser Kundis, the big prankster. This is a Yiddish humor periodical that was uh, issued in New York during the first decades of the 20th century. And this wide range of anthropomorphizations can also reveal how differently people have conceptualized the nature of Yiddish by ascribing to it a character, by giving it a personality. Attributing a personality to Yiddish yields some of its most vivid anthropomorphizations. Now, asserting that any language has a personality shifts attention away from it as a means of communication, of, of sharing information or opinions or feelings, speculations, and so on. Instead, this notion centers on the language as having some inherent signifying power above and beyond the semantic value of whatever is uttered or written in it. This attribution of a personality to a language both diminishes and expands its scope. On one hand, this suggests that the language is inherently constrained by its character, which either inhibits 
or skews the ability to use the language comprehensively. On the other hand, a language's personality implicitly imbues anything conveyed in the language with an extra register of meaning. People are more likely to attribute a personality to a language when it is engaged at some distance. For example, when it is encountered as a foreign language or as a language juxtaposed against other languages or as a partial language or as an endangered language or as a language under critical scrutiny. All of these possibilities have, have pertained at some point to Yiddish. The literature scholar Binyamin Harshav attributes the propensity to think of Yiddish as having a personality to the language's foundational vernacularity. He argued that regardless of how Yiddish is used, associations with its orality and cultural intimacy inform what Harshav terms the semiotics of Yiddish. And so in 1990, he wrote the following. In the 20th century, Yiddish has been used for many kinds of discourse, often quite contradictory to whatever might be its inherent or accepted nature. The oral, this oral and popular language has been successfully harnessed to impressionist prose, historiography, linguistic and statistical research, political propaganda, and ivory tower poetry. Nevertheless, in social perception, the language did carry a cluster of characteristic features developed in its unique history and crystallized in its modern literature. The very fact that native speakers may assign such emotive qualities to the language, rather than seeing it as a neutral vehicle for communication, speaks for itself. Ascribing a personality to Yiddish has a longer history, but this practice has become more expansive and perhaps more urgent in the decades following World War II. And this practice is particularly prevalent when devotees of Yiddish extol its distinct character in other languages in order to convey its value to audiences that are unfamiliar with Yiddish. These accolades sometimes appear in books that compile selected glosses of Yiddish terms, historical information, explanations of traditional customs, or translations of anecdotes, all in an effort to celebrate the scope of Yiddish culture. For example, the preface to The Joys of Yiddish, Leo Rostin's very popular relaxed lexicon, which is how he described the book, uh, um, published in 1968, offers an overtly anthropomorphic description of its character. He writes, I think Yiddish a language of exceptional charm. Like a street gamin who has survived unnameable adversities, it is bright, audacious, mischievous. I think it a tongue that never takes its tongue out of its cheek. At its, in its innermost heart, Yiddish swings between schmaltz and derision. Then Morris Samuel writes in his 1971 book, In Praise of Yiddish, a similar address of what he terms the inside feel of Yiddish, which he asserts is a mirror of the total Jewish condition over the last 2000 years. However, as he is aware of other characterizations of the language, Samuel first cautions against what he describes as those who would harbor a sentimental but uninstructed affection for Yiddish as a quaint patois, which has somehow produced a number of gifted writers, as well as those Jews whose vestigial Yiddish is of the kind cultivated by borscht circuit comedians posing as experts. With this warning, Samuel suggests, if inadvertently, that these more limited or more distorted perceptions of Yiddish are also part of its character uh, as a language whose significance is often misunderstood or underestimated. The practice of attributing a personality to Yiddish engages the language in what I have termed the post-vernacular mode. 
As I discussed in my 2005 book, Adventures in Yiddishland, post-vernacularity privileges the language's secondary symbolic level of signification over its primary level of communicating information. In other words, in the post-vernacular mode, the very fact that something is written or is said in Yiddish as opposed to some other language is as important as the content being conveyed, if not sometimes more so. Post-vernacular engagement with Yiddish long predates the Holocaust, but in its wake, this mode of using or discussing the language has come to the fore. The deliberate, self-conscious nature of post-vernacular Yiddish contributes to conceiving of the language as having a personality. And the notion that Yiddish embodies a distinctive character addresses the implicit question of why one might turn to the language in the post-World War II era, when its use has diminished and its future may seem uncertain. Assessing the personality of Yiddish often entails discussing what are perceived as either its deficits or its excesses. And in both cases, this implies that the language has a defining imbalance of character. Regarding the former, Maurice Samuel's portrait of Yiddish includes what he considered to be its blind side. He maintains that although the language possesses words for plants and animals, it lacks a sensibility for the natural world, such as we find in no other language. This despite the fact that until the late 19th century, as he notes, the major part of Yiddish speaking Jewry lived in small towns and villages in close proximity to, though not in, nature. Similarly, Samuel argues, Yiddish does not have a feel for the Gentile world, whether Christian or pagan. This lack, he insists, is not a matter of vocabulary. Even if an equivalent or near equivalent could be found for every word, an idiom, he maintains that addressing these topics in Yiddish would seem to belong to an unintelligible world. Samuel thereby suggests that the language boasts thorough in its expression of what he terms the Jewish condition, and at the same time, it is limited to the sensibility. Now, this argument does not square with the views of Yiddishists who champion the language's comprehensive breadth, as exemplified by, for example, the wealth of terms for plant life in Nachum Stutzkoff's The Thoris, uh, Der Oitze von der Yiddische Sprach. And on the left here, you see just the first of several pages of lists of plant terminology. Or those that are in Mordechai Schechter's dictionary of Yiddish botanical terminology. But this notion of the language as having inherent weaknesses and the implicit corresponding limitations of its speakers is hardly new. Indeed, it frequently featured in attacks on Yiddish by 19th century Maskilim, who championed the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment's agenda of integration into mainstream Western culture. Moreover, Similar criticisms can even be found on occasion by some of the language's advocates. For example, this critique figures provocatively in a landmark work of Yiddish literature by one of its most ardent proponents, Yitzhak Leibish Peretz's poem, Monish. Initially published in 1888, it is sometimes identified as the first modern Yiddish poem. Monish relates a mock cautionary tale of the title character, a Jewish youth who is led astray by his attraction to a foreign woman who is actually a sinister demon in disguise. About midway through the poem, Peretz interrupts the narrative with a disquisition on the, the incapacity of Yiddish to address the subject of romantic love. I'll read it first in Yiddish and then translate. Anders wollt mein Lied geklingen, so von Goyem, Goyes singen. Nicht verlieben, nicht jargon, kein rechten Klang, kein rechten Ton, so von Liebe, von Gefühl, nicht kein passen Wort, kein Stil. 
how differently this song is sung for Gentiles in a Gentile tongue, but not for Jews, not in jargon. And jargon at the time was used as an often derisive term for Yiddish. It doesn't have the proper tone for love or feelings. Not one word that suits the subject can be heard. Now, Peretz's uh, meta discourse on the character of Yiddish in this passage very archly echoes the argument that was made by earlier Maskilim that the language lacks, among other things, the capacity for expressing romantic love. Following this sequence, and it goes on from another five stanzas, the poem returns to the plot and it recounts how Manish eventually succumbs to his demonic temptress. She exhorts him to swear his love by articles of Jewish piety, by his payas, by the paroichas, and ultimately by God's name, and this seals Monish's doom. His demise is not only the result of his blasphemy, having been seduced by a femme fatale who represents the forbidden enticements of Western culture. Monish is also damned because of his inability to articulate romantic sentiments properly, given the limitations of his native language. And this implicitly is emblematic of a larger cultural deficit among its speakers. Moreover, by offering this playfully double-edged critique of Yiddish in a Yiddish poem that is modern in its form and in its worldview, even as it draws on a trove of traditional Jewish lore, Peretz suggests new possibilities for the language as the voice of irony. Now, whereas some observers regard the personality of Yiddish as deficient in certain areas, others view it as plentiful in different aspects. This is especially the case after the Holocaust. As part of the beatified portrait of pre-war Yiddish culture presented in their 1952 book, Life is with People, the Jewish little town of Eastern Europe, uh, reissued with the subtitle you see here, The Culture of the Shtetl. The anthropologists Marx Borowski and Elizabeth Herzog explain that Yiddish is rich in terms for referring to a learned man. They list 10 examples, noting that these are only a few of the terms used in everyday speech to denote traditional Jewish erudition. But far more attention has been paid to the abundance of piquant Yiddish idioms, especially proverbs. These have been anthologized repeatedly, both in the original language and in translation. These are just a few examples. The linguist James Matasoff introduces his 1979 study of what he calls Yiddish psychoostensives, that is, conventionalized idioms that voice blessings, curses, hopes, and fears by asserting that Jews have always admired articulate, flavorful speech, and that Yiddish has the deserved reputation of being a highly expressive language. Like Maurice Samuel, Matasoff seeks to correct others' portrayals of Yiddish as he offers his own uh, characterization of the language. He writes, this funkiness of the language has been sentimentalized over with insistent vulgarity by some popular writers. At the other extreme, we find the somewhat solemn academic approach of the professional Yiddishist, for whom the Yiddish language is primarily a vehicle for high-minded scholarly endeavor, a precious jewel to be preserved intact for an ever dwindling cultural elite. To determine just what gives the language its considerable emotive power, Matasoff argues for studying the earthier side of Yiddish. He explains the richness of the language's idioms as a reaction against the burdensome existence of East European Jews, whom he describes as culturally isolated, economically impoverished, and socially oppressed. He further writes, for Jews with limited access to the mainstream of Western culture and the shtetlach of Eastern Europe, the outside gentle world was often rather hostile, cold, and intimidating. The inner Jewish world, in compensation, despite its material poverty, 
and frequent pettiness was at least full of overt demonstrations of feeling, heartfelt loves and hatreds, fears and hopes received constant outward expression in the language of the people. So for Matasoff, this aspect of Yiddish is noteworthy, not merely for its histrionics, but more significantly for providing its speakers with a defiant source of empowerment and a means of voicing moral convictions in the face of frequent injustices. Especially complex characterizations of Yiddish are offered by some Ashkenazic Jews who were not native speakers of the language, but who were at some remove, if only by a generation or two, from its speech community. Among German speaking Jews at the turn of the 20th century, this relationship was shaped by the longstanding perspective of Germanists who had pathologized both Yiddish and its speakers. The discomfort produced by these Jews attenuated relationship with Yiddish fostered an understanding of its character that exposed their own fundamental ambiguity about Jewish. Perhaps the most famous examples are Sigmund Freud's references to Yiddish, particularly in his 1905 study, zum Unbewussten, uh, jokes and their relation to the unconscious. This really exemplifies the uh, complexity. Yiddish is an essential element of some of the jokes that Freud analyzes in this work, and it has prompted scholars to probe the psychoanalyst's relationship to Jewishness. Among them is the linguist Christopher Hutton, who notes, as have others, Freud's clear association of Yiddish with the natural, the true self that is suppressed in the process of transition and translation. This association tracks the dynamic in Freud's family from his ancestors who were traditionally observant Jews living in provincial Galicia to Freud's own cosmopolitan secular life in Vienna, which was marked in part by a shift in vernacular language. As a consequence of this, Hutton argues, linguistic insecurity cannot have been absent from Freud's personality. The slip from German to Yiddish, which would betray the hidden self underneath, would have been an important factor in the genesis of Freud's sensitivity to the revealing nature of small deviations from normative behavior. Hutton proposes that the use of Yiddish and the jokes that Freud cites in this study are linguistic slips that control this regression. The language is employed as a sign of the wish or of the need for this repressed inner self to be revealed. Therefore, for Jewish tellers of these jokes, their use of Yiddish constitutes a kind of therapy. Another example is Franz Kafka who offered a more playfully contradictory enactment of this fraught characterization of Yiddish in a famous lecture on the language that he delivered in conjunction with a recital of Yiddish poetry by the actor Yitzhak Levy in Prague's Jewish Town Hall in 1912. Speaking in German, Kafka confronted his audience's anxieties about Yiddish by asserting how much more Yiddish you understand than you think. Kafka's remarks on the nature of Yiddish are so laden with errors in the speech that they appear to be coyly deliberate. He characterizes the language as tangled, lacking in lucidity, its grammar undocumented and undocumentable, and consisting solely of foreign words and only of dialect. On the one hand, he warns his audience that you will not understand a word of Yiddish. You will try to make out what you know already, and you'll miss what's really there. On the other hand, Kafka assures his listeners that they nevertheless have an inherent ability to understand Yiddish intuitively. If you relax, you'll suddenly find yourselves in the midst of Yiddish. This will prove so powerful, 
he tells his audience that they will no longer be afraid of Yiddish, but of themselves, and that Yiddish can help them overcome that fear. Kafka provocatively suggests that it's precisely the tension between the anxieties associated with the language's otherness and the allure of its potential accessibility that defines his audience's ambivalent relationship to their Jewishness. So like Freud, Kafka characterized Yiddish as emblematic of both a Jewish pathology and its cure. The literature scholar Evelyn Torton Beck argues that Kafka's intense interest in Yiddish theater in the years 1910 to 1912, as discussed extensively in his diaries, informed his distinctive literary style. This interest, she argues, also led to Kafka's perception of what she describes as the highly connotative nature of Yiddish, which is especially rich in idiom and nuance and is characterized by warmth and intimacy. Thus, Kafka wrote that to call a Jewish mother by the German word Mutter is to create a false image since the German language is colder and more formal than Yiddish. Beck suggests that Kafka's prose, though of course it is written in German, is haunted by the personality of Yiddish, which served as a reminder of the problematic fit between the author and his literary language. Now, not all German speaking Jews attributed to Yiddish a characterization that reflected their own anxieties about an inescapable Jewish otherness. The philosopher Martin Duber, I mean, uh, Martin Buber, for example, introduced his 1903 translation of a Yiddish play by David Pinsky into German by explaining that Yiddish was not just a rich, but a supple language, less abstract, but warmer than the Hebrew, which it has enriched. Yiddish may lack the pure spiritual pathos of Hebrew, but it is replete with incomparably softer and sturdier, tender and rough inflections. In Yiddish, the very substance of the people has in itself become a language. For Buber, Yiddish was an emotionally vibrant folkhood incarnate, defined explicitly in contrast to the elevated stature of Hebrew and implicitly, like Kafka, against the emotionally cool constraints of an assimilated Jew's German. Buber reported being drawn to Yiddish folktales because they seem to live only by virtue of the unique inflections of that inimitable language of East European Jewry. Emotionally driven characterizations of Yiddish are often gendered with an array of associations, generally made by men, of the language as female. For example, writing in Eastern Europe in the late 1880s, Sholom Yankov Abramovich, who was known to his readers as Mendel Mochosvorum, Mendel the, the book peddler, explained his turn as an author of fiction from Hebrew to Yiddish by comparing the latter language to a foreign seductress whom the author found irresistible, despite or because of the illicit nature of her allure. Abramovich characterized the attraction as both erotic and exotic, conjuring his Yiddish femme fatale not as a familiar presence, but within the milieu of modern literature as an alien. At the same time, the literary critic Yosef Yehuda Lerner characterized the language as an inspiring female figure in the rhetoric of classical allegory writing on the green hill where all the muses stand before the throne of glory, the Yiddish muse has an honored place and has been graced with equal measure of loveliness and beauty. Now in post-World War II America, a very different set of anxieties seem to inform the personalities attributed to Yiddish 
exemplified by this slogan. If you can't say anything nice, say it in Yiddish. It might seem to have been lifted from Peretz's aforementioned discussion of the language in Munish, but this is the title, as you can see here, of a recently issued English language collection of Yiddish curses. This sentiment also appears emblazoned on t-shirts, coffee mugs, lapel buttons, and other mass-produced items available for purchase. This pithy characterization of Yiddish extends to other publications and material objects appearing primarily in post-war America, which present Yiddish as a language of invective, of histrionics, and of vulgarity. These phenomena include an array of comic dictionaries, which provide playful glosses and anecdotes to selected Yiddish terms. Some of these books, such as these, Drek the Real Yiddish Your Bubba Never Taught, and Dirty Yiddish, every, Everyday Slang from What's Up to F Off, present Yiddish as the idiom par excellence for profanity. Other comic dictionaries, titled Yiddish for Yankees and Every Goy's Guide to Common Yiddish Expressions suggest that they are especially meant to provide cultural outsiders with access to the secrets of Yiddish. But note that the front cover of the latter book reads under the title that the book is also recommended for Jews who don't know their punim from their pupik. Here, the non-Jewish reader serves as the rationale for a dictionary that is also intended for Jews lacking in Yiddish literacy. Similar to these books is an assortment of mass-produced ephemera imprinted with one or more Yiddish words, almost always Romanized, and often in what I call a kosher style font, such as what you see here, which imitates the traditional curves and serifs of the Jewish alphabet. Sometimes these items evoke sentimentality, but most of the words, uh, such as these examples here, uh, but most of the words on these objects are provocative, as we see in these examples. And in these manifestations, Yiddish always appears in fragmentary form, as isolated words rather than whole language, and as a signifier of the flamboyant, the irrational, the belligerent, or the carnal, but never the dispassionate. As these examples manifest, Yiddish in the United States has changed in the period after World War II, becoming less a sign of Jewish vernacularity than one of linguistic and cultural obstinacy or otherness. The linguist Uriel Weinreich noted this shift in Yiddish use and signification in the early 1950s. In post-war America, he posited, this, like other immigrant languages, that in, he, that in this context he deemed obsolescent, seemed to acquire peculiar connotations and to be applied to special functions, even after it has lost its main communicative role. Under a rapidly progressing language shift, it acquires a certain esoteric value. Obsolescent languages also easily develop comic associations. Among children of American immigrants, the mere utterance of a word in their parents' language easily evokes laughter. The stylistic specialization of an obsolescent language and the association of it with intimate childhood experiences is conducive to the borrowing of its lexical elements into the younger people's speech. Particularly apt to be transferred are colorful idiomatic expressions, difficult to translate, with strong affective overtones, whether endearing, pejorative, or mildly obscene. This engagement with Yiddish has continued in the United States into the present. The characterization of the language among many Yiddish speaking immigrants' children who came of age in the middle decades of the 20th century, as Uriel Weinreich observed 
and as is exemplified in this uh, poster for a Yiddish lesson, um, this has been transmitted to younger generations and they in turn receive Yiddish as a mock heritage. They understand it as inherently fragment fragmentary, unrestrained and carnivalesque. They preserve this heritage by perpetuating this limited vocabulary, as we see here, in the modes of sentimentality, ridicule, or indelicacy. Assessments of the character of Yiddish inevitably approach it selectively. This is a result of either a limited familiarity with its full scope or a deliberate focus on those aspects of the language that are considered to be the epitome of its distinctive nature. People who strive to describe the personality of Yiddish sometimes juxtapose their observations against others. And this demonstrates how contingent and subjective these assessments can be. In light of the wide range of characteristics attributed to Yiddish, that it is essentially pious or vulgar or histrionic or ironic or playful or constrained, it may be tempting to think of the language as suffering from multiple personalities. But such a diagnosis reflects an expectation that Yiddish ought to be consistent across speech communities, as well as in the eyes and ears of all those attending to it, when that in fact is not the case. Native speakers' efforts to attribute a character to Yiddish may reveal their sense of change in its value as a vernacular once widely shared among Ashkenazi Jews. For those who claim Yiddish as an ancestral language and engage it later in life, endowing it with a character becomes an implicit exercise in self-scrutiny. For these individuals, Yiddish figures in their self-examination by being both at a distance from them and yet in some way connected. Not only is the scope of their engagements with Yiddish frequently limited to isolated words or idioms, these engagements take place in formats apart from vernacular language use, such as staged performances, anthologies of translations, or material goods. Often, it is precisely those attributes of Yiddish that were once reviled, that it was a sign of ethnic particularism, or of irrational religious fervor, or of scholarly pietism, or of unrefined earthiness. These are the things that subsequently attract younger generations. Their interest is rooted in a desire to engage through Yiddish, a form of Jewishness understood as arcane or as lost. It is envisioned as organic, authentic, and comprehensive, realized in the intense expressivity of vernacular speech. This devotion to Yiddish is different from that of secular Yiddishists for whom the language is emblematic of ethnic legitimacy and vitality. It also differences from the commitment of contemporary Hasidim to Yiddish, who value it for defining their community's constituency and its borders. Rather, this is a post-vernacular attachment to the language. It is shaped by being at a distance from Yiddish as a language of daily life. This distance is not only or even primarily a limitation. Instead, it is exactly what animates the interest in Yiddish. Moreover, it imbues the language with a sense of liveliness that can take on a personality, embodying the desires that those who engage with Yiddish seek to fulfill. And with that, I with, uh, will unshare my screen and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Professor Chandler. Um, the first question is from uh, Nicoletta. I think uh, you kind of gave some examples, but uh, is Yiddish ever written in Latin alphabet? So it's a good question. Uh, Yiddish 
traditionally, and for the most part to this day, is written with the Aleph base, the, the Jewish alphabet used for Hebrew and used for most other Jewish languages. However, uh, there have been a number of efforts to Romanize it, to write it with, a, with, a, with uh, the, uh, the Latin letters. And um, uh, while we see this, for example, in uh, the, especially, um, you know, these comic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, material goods with Yiddish words on them, they're almost always written, uh, not with the Aleph base, but with the Roman alphabet. There actually were efforts to, uh, uh, that, that Yiddish should stop using the Aleph base and should use the Roman alphabet to make it a modern language that was parallel to other European languages, most of which use that alphabet. And this includes uh, some of the leading uh, champions of Yiddish, like Chaim Zhitlovsky, uh, also um, uh, Zamenhof, who was, uh, uh, was very interested in Yiddish and, uh, early in his career before he went on to invent Esperanto. And uh, it, there are, have been over the years a number of books, uh, collections of uh, jokes, collections of uh, proverbs, uh, of humorous stories, also of poetry that offer the texts in, in, in romanization. But for the most part, uh, that, that, has not, um, that, that has not been an extensive practice. The other really interesting example of this for very different reasons could be found in the immediate post-World post -war, post War II years in uh, displaced persons camps uh, in uh, Germany and, and other European countries where these camps were set up. Um, and there were newspapers and posters and other items printed with a Romanized alphabet because they could not get any typeface that had the olive base because it had been destroyed during the war. And so we see some very interesting examples of uh, texts that were printed in the Roman alphabet for that reason uh, in the, in the, the first uh, post-war years uh, uh, in Europe. But um, uh, except for that, um, the, uh, you know, most of the efforts have been an effort to, uh, to try and bridge the, the gap between people who don't know this alphabet, but who uh, either know the language orally or would like to just experience the sound of the language. So for example, if you don't know the alphabet, but you want to know what poems sound like in the original where language play is especially important. As a result, there have been some anthologies um, of Yiddish poetry where uh, the texts are, are written in the Roman alphabet. Thank you very much, Professor. That kind of leads us to the next question, which is aside from the jokes and the, Chas and the Hasidim, are there any current literary works being created in Yiddish? Uh, yes, there are uh, quite uh, an interesting range of literary works uh, being created, first of all, by some Hasidim, uh, including uh, Hasidim who are Hasidic dissidents and who are writing uh, in Yiddish to uh, satirize and critique their community. So not only pietistic writings, but among people who aren't Hasidim, there are people writing poetry, plays, short stories, novels, uh, people my age and younger, um, uh, some of whom uh, come to Yiddish as a second language, uh, but who uh, want, to, uh, want to use it as a, a, a voice for, uh, especially for personal uh, expressivity. So uh, one of the things that I've noticed, especially among younger writers, is that they're using Yiddish to write very personal, confessional kind of writing, especially in the poetry. And um, uh, th there's more of it appearing, uh, uh, more than I'm able to keep track of myself, and uh, being published in a number of different places. Uh, in the United States, in Israel, also in Sweden, uh, where there is a magazine called Yiddishland um, that uh, 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 prints uh, essays, poems, uh, uh, prose fiction, uh, and um, that was recently started, but uh, 
um, uh, has uh, been publishing now, I think, uh, for, for several years. And there's also uh, Yiddish writing uh, published online as well uh, as in print. Thank you very much. Um, there's one more question and then uh, after you answer, I'll open the microphone for the microphones for everyone to, uh, if there are any more questions or to, just uh, to say thank you. Uh, so the last, the last question will be, um, you mentioned in your uh, presentation an earlier book that you wrote, Adventures in Yiddishland. Can you explain uh, what was the focus of that book compared to the more recent book that you uh, discussed today? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this book, Adventures in Yiddish Land, appeared I was about 15 years ago, and uh, it focuses specifically on Yiddish after World War II. And I wanted to uh, uh, write a book that looked at uh, Yiddish in this contemporary period uh, that would understand it on its own terms, rather than uh, uh, evaluating it as people tended to do uh, at the time um, in relation to what it had been before. And therefore, the discussion of Yiddish in the post-World War II period was what it was not rather than what it was. And uh, I felt that that was really not, um, a, not a particularly helpful way to look at uh, especially contemporary Yiddish activity that was taking place at the turn of the 21st century, uh, either intellectually or culturally. And so uh, I set about writing this book and wanted to look at the full range of activities, um, including things like uh, these uh, silly material objects with the Yiddish words on them, including how people were learning Yiddish, uh, uh, how people were translating not only from Yiddish, but translating into Yiddish. Uh, and that's a practice that continues to this day, um, such as a, a spate of classic children's books originally written in English or German or French that have been translated into Yiddish. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, it was from looking at this range of material that I started to develop this idea of the post vernacular mode. The fact that in this period, even though this, you could see this phenomenon well before the war, uh, but in the post war period, um, this uh, engagement with Yiddish, where the fact that you were doing something in Yiddish, the fact that you were either writing or speaking or singing, performing in Yiddish, that was important in its own right, in, in not only what you were saying, but that you were saying in Yiddish. And sometimes it was even more important. It had a kind of primacy. And uh, I think that was really uh, uh, key for me to, uh, understand that Yiddish in the period uh, from the mid 20th century forward, it's now in a new era. Uh, rather than looking at it as a language in decline, a language that is um, uh, endangered on its way out, but rather to see it as a language uh, that is in a, in a very different, very new phase in its history. So that was what was behind uh, that previous book. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll see you in our next event. The microphones are released. Thank you. Lailata from Jerusalem. I arrived uh, a little bit late, but I've certainly enjoyed uh, the content uh, of this lecture. Um, and I'd just like to mention that uh, Yiddish was one of my first languages, mm -hmm. uh, but when I came uh, to my current home country, Canada, I, I learned English uh, very quickly as a child. And then gradually over the years, I've lost a lot of my Yiddish abilities. Uh, a few days ago, I met a, a Russian couple who had immigrated to Canada and, and they didn't speak English that well and I don't speak Russian. And when I tried to speak Yiddish, it was quite a struggle. So, uh, 
my you know my point is that i i'm thinking of trying to revive my uh, earlier yiddish which was fairly elementary and it is interesting i just mentioned in closing that uh, you can find yiddish theater on youtube and it, it, it's quite quite interesting i once found a, a play with theodore Bikel in it speaking yiddish and that was quite quite an experience thank you very much Thank you. I'll have to look for that play. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, for people who do want to learn the language at any age, whether it was a language you were exposed to or come to completely new, there are increasing opportunities to learn the language. And what's remarkable is that in this past year, where we're doing everything on Zoom like this, um, there have been uh, a number of added opportunities to learn the language online. And the enrollments in Yiddish classes have uh, uh, gone way up to the point that um, I, I know that uh, places in New York that offer Yiddish uh, language instruction online, they've had to add extra classes. They haven't been able to admit everybody because you don't want the class to get too big so everybody gets a chance to talk, you know? And that uh, that's a really interesting development. And it's one of many things I think people are going to be uh, watching for in our post-pandemic uh, era is to what extent things like language learning classes online will continue when you live in a place where you're not close to uh, a language class that you could visit in person. So um, that's something to consider uh, uh, both for uh, Mr. Bricks and, and for others who are listening. I see Nathaniel uh, Dror and, and, and Lind uh, Jaffe have raised their hands. So maybe Nathaniel, I saw yours first. Do you want to yes, say anything? Yes, I've got two questions. First of all, sure. um, the, um, in the post, uh, in the pre, uh, pre World War II era, uh, when Ladino um, began to go to uh, Roman alphabet, it seemed to be much easier. Now, I don't know if that's because Spanish had been the root of that language. Uh, but is that the case? Uh, uh, why it was more difficult for Yiddish to go to Roman? And my second question is, uh, there was this great effort by the Soviet Union to really um, give the world Yiddish, uh, but now we don't have a Soviet Union. And so uh, is there any continual uh, 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 efforts in, in the Russian republics, or is that all gone? Those are two really good questions. Uh, so I my guess is, and I know with Ladino, uh, there's, um, you will see, uh, it wasn't like a complete switch over to the Roman alphabet, uh, but you will see um, uh, use of the Roman alphabet as well as use of, of uh, the, uh, uh, the Jewish alphabet. Um, uh, in, in, by different folks. In the case of Yiddish, my guess is, because you're talking about a much larger population, uh, that it would, uh, it would take a special effort to make the case. Um, and when you think about, um, for some of those folks, uh, the, the Roman alphabet would be something new in its own right. So for example, if you live in Russia, or if you live in the Soviet Union, uh, you know the Cyrillic alphabet from Russian, you don't know the Roman alphabet. And of course, uh, for uh, folks living in Israel, uh, I mean, many people know English, but again, it's, uh, you know, why would you switch over when you, when you know uh, how to use the Aleph base, although you use it differently for, for Hebrew than you use it for, for Yiddish. So uh, um, my guess well, is those course, might be- what happened. What happened with Ladino is you did have this uh, big push by Ataturk to uh, Romanize all of the languages. And, and so the Romanization of, of Ladino is uh, very much a part of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, it really, it takes both uh, people who want to, you know, make it happen and uh, to do it and, and, and to you know, do it from strategic vantages. And you also need a public that's willing to go along. In the case of Yiddish with um, 
uh, you know, any, you know, any efforts to, to change it programmatically have always been struggling against the fact that it, it's, there, there's no, you know, uh, central office of Yiddish that people universally acknowledge. And if anything, Yiddish speakers have a long ongoing uh, tendency to uh, go their own way and to resist efforts to standardize uh, their, whether it's their spoken language or their written language. And uh, so it, it may be a difference in temperament as well. Uh, I mean, of course that's a speculation. That this, um, you know, uh, uh, Yiddish in, you know, in the Soviet Union, it's a very uh, a fraught history of, on the one hand, you know, in the early decades of the Soviet Union, unprecedented state-sponsored support for Yiddish, but it was state-sponsored that came also with state regulation, as was the case for all the other languages of, of national minorities in the Soviet Union. And that this was uh, gradually shut down um, uh, by the by, the late 1930s uh, uh, under Stalin, as there was a greater push to centralize and to Russify Soviet culture, and Yiddish met uh, uh, in the Soviet Union with a, a very tragic um, ending with uh, the shutting down of all its public culture in the late 40s, uh, the arrest and murder of leading figures in the Yiddish uh, cultural world in the early 1950s and the absence of anything in Yiddish from 48 to 59. In 59, Yiddish is, in, if you will, rehabilitated and you begin to see publications, but uh, on, on a limited basis. Uh, and of course, state regulated, the way everything was state regulated uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, cultural production. In the post-Soviet period, what is interesting is that you do have um, an interest uh, in uh, 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 uncovering the riches of Yiddish culture from the Soviet period, from the pre-Soviet period. And there's been a lot of interaction among uh, scholars and among performers uh, from the West and from, uh, you know, the, the, from, from the former Soviet uh, uh, republics. Uh, of each learning from the other. And I know uh, for people who are interested for, in particular in um, Yiddish uh, folk song, there are folk songs that only the folks uh, in the former Soviet Union know that my uh, friends who are musicians uh, are eager to learn from their contact with, um, with fo fo folks in the former Soviet Union and vice versa. And there's been uh, this kind of movement uh, back and forth and creating of cultural festivals uh, uh, in, um, uh, in Russia and in uh, some of the uh, uh, former Soviet republics in, in Ukraine in particular. So um, th there's, uh, uh, and, and in um, uh, Vilnius uh, for many years uh, ran a, uh, an intensive Yiddish summer program. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of very interesting things that happen, things that happen around Yiddish uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, former Soviet Union in the, in the, in the post-Soviet period. Uh, let's see, I saw um, uh, some other questions. Uh, Lynn, uh, I think you were next. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, I'm Lynn from South Africa. Um, I've just published my debut novel at this ripe old age that I've used a, I've used a time traveling Picara concept. <clears throat> I did a master of arts I've translated it into a book, but the, the interesting thing to tell this group is my character speaks Yiddish. She's, she doesn't speak Yiddish, she uses it as you've called it as the peppering of her personality that actually resonates a lot with everything you've said tonight. And the interesting thing for me is to find that Jewish people, in other words, people of, of, of the origin of the Ashkenazi, Eastern European who came here impoverished. Um, they were first classified as non-Europeans because it wasn't a European language. And I've, what's interesting to me, because I won't change a word of the book for anyone, I put a glossary up now, uh -huh. but it, it's, and, and it, it's, it, it's blasphemous in the sense that she's a, a Jewish girl who won't go to the back of the shul again. She's, she's the voice of the feminist oh. time traveler. And, and I mean, I'll punt the book later, but my point is that what I found weird was that the left-wingy, in other words, enlightened, almost assimilated Jewish person 
seems to have a problem with the Yiddish the way I didn't expect. And, mm -hmm. and this, this idea of the, the reminder of where you came from, the slight sense of self-loathing, the position in, in society of the, of the female, because we're a very shtetl Jewish society in South Africa. We, we, we just imported it out of the shtetls. Um, so I, I just want, and, and also I am using it in, you know, my spirit animal is Stephen Fry. So it's, it's a very urbane, serio comic use, but the Yiddish seems to be defeating the very people that it's aimed for as a satirical, very much what you say about what the language contains. I'm not a Yiddish fluent speaker. I might very well have to go and learn it because now mm -hmm. I've used it and it's my, my history. But I, I just wondered what, it was a comment and a thank you and a welcome but I, I just wondered how you felt about that. Is that a common response to using the Yiddish language? This is, this is very, first of all, the book sounds really interesting. Um, and um, uh, there, and, and there are other writers who have tried different strategies, certainly people writing in English, which I know best, to uh, incorporate uh, 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 elements of Yiddish in their writing in different ways. And in many cases, there, there does have to be a glossary because um, the, uh, the base of knowledge of people who are you know, a couple generations removed from uh, a language, and this is, this is true for other languages as well, um, the vocabulary they know is, is very limited. And, uh, uh, and, and what tends to get passed on from generation to generation at this point is a limited vocabulary, it doesn't expand. Yeah. So uh, people who uh, have a different, wider range of, of even a partial knowledge of a language will find not everybody knows the same thing. And so uh, your book may uh, uh, provoke people to uh, learn more about the language as a result. That sounds really interesting. Just, just very quickly, because I know everyone has to go. What's interesting to me is, so for example, Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, he used yes. a language that was based on kind of Russian slang right. and stuff. Um, nobody seemed to have a problem with that. And that's, it, it's just, I have used a glossary in an interactive, the ebook is interactive mm -hmm. now so that you don't get defeated by chametz or chutzpah uh -huh. or, or zitzflesh. And in fact, I've started what I've called a shiksenary. So the shiksenary is, is, is produced for the, for the non-Jewish population, but actually who it's really talking to are, are our own people who have kind of taken a step removed from their, their own history and culture. But thank you. Okay, well, thank you. I'm gonna check it out. Uh, Michelle, it. I think, Michelle, I think is next, who has a question. Thank you, sir. First of all, thank you very much because uh, your idea is quite uh, enlightening and uh, very creative. Uh, I am a child of both Yiddish and Ladino. Oh, fantastic. Yes, I just wanted to say to the previous uh, commenter on uh, Ladino, there is no question that Ladino did not move over quickly or even in its entirety from the Rashi script to uh, Romanized language. As a matter of fact, there's a uh, fair amount of uh, back and forth in the 20th century prior to the Holocaust um, um, newspapers about the whole concept. It was a big mishigas, let's call it like that. Just yes, so no, same thing was going on with Yiddish at the same time. It's so interesting. Yeah. There you go. So what I was wondering is, uh, do you have the ability to comment on Yiddish's sister in any way, shape, or form? Although I realize that it's not your uh, your forte, or perhaps you know somebody who has done something similar in terms of anthropomorphizing uh, Ladino. You know, it's a really good question. It's not my area of expertise. I do have colleagues, you know, who uh, uh, work on, uh, on on Ladino and. Uh, they, um, the first person that comes to mind who's been working on it for a very long time is David Bunis, who's, who's based in Israel, and um, who I, I, I think of as sort of the senior scholar in the field, but there are other people working on it as well, to be sure. Uh, but he was the person I first was, you know, reading his work to, to learn what, what relatively little I know about, about it. Uh, and it would be interesting to... Uh, see uh, to what extent there's something analogous uh, and, uh, and and what forms they take. Um, 
I, I haven't ever seen like, you know, these material culture with Ladino words on it. And maybe they're out there, but I've never seen them. That may be a distinctly, first of all, I think it's distinctly American. I don't think you find them in other, even in Canada, I don't think you find them unless they're imported from the United States. It seems to be our gift to the rest of the world, <laughs> if, 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 if we may call it that, or Europeans, you don't see it. Um, uh, but there, it may also emerge, for example, uh, which I only touch on a little bit in literature, um, where, uh, and especially poetry, where, um, you know, an imaginary relationship with the language that can be personified. Um, there's a whole genre in Yiddish of Yiddish poems about Yiddish. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a similar genre of Ladino poems about Ladino, uh, and, but I don't know them. Uh, but there you, it would be interesting to see if um, uh, attributing a personality to the language emerges there. Uh, basically where you see it is where, where people get creative. You know, so like the, the, the cartoons in the Yiddish press that I showed um, and, um, uh, and the other place you might see it is when people look to explain the language uh, to other people. So books in English or in Hebrew or, or in Spanish or, or, or other languages about Ladino, do they uh, start talking about that the language has a personality? And my guess is uh, it's a different personality than the personality of Yiddish. That's just my hunch. Thank you, sir, for your- So check it out. And if, if you find anything interesting, send me an email and tell me I'll learn something from you. Bezrat Hashem, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't know if there are any other questions or- I have comment. Yes, sir. Um, are two bits of inf information. One, there is a group uh, called a um, program called Yiddish Vach. Yes. With one week, yes. where all the participants, 150, usually about 150, speak mm -hmm. only Yiddish, and all the material that's written and is in Yiddish. So it's it's an emotional experience to be in this other country, you know, seemingly other country where everybody speaks Yiddish. And if you lapse, they will remind you of what, of what country you're at. It's, it's quite an experience. And secondly, um, Rodale Press tried an experiment with a journal, a Yiddish lingo uh, in the early 70s, in which everything was transliterated. They felt that the alphabet was what stood in the way uh, between the uh, culture and the, mm -hmm. and, and the people. And that lasted about two years, but uh, it was an interesting experiment. Thank you for both of those. Well, so I've been to Yiddish Vach, and uh, you're right. It's um, what's interesting is the activities are the same activities you could have at any summer camp in the United States in terms of, you know, you go boating, you play baseball, you have meals, you sing songs, but everything's in Yiddish. And, um, and uh, I've seen, you know, where, for example, uh, when I was there at one point, I went for a walk in the woods by myself and I ran into um, a guy and two girls and they were speaking uh, in Russian to one another. And uh, they suddenly froze and started apologizing because I had caught them doing something illicit with, you know, and it's like, I thought, you know, in other summer camps, you know, people sneak off to, you know, they smoke dope or they're making out or something like this. Here, the illicit activity is speaking another language. So uh, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting as an effort to um, have uh, uh, familiar activities uh, that um, are in a language that uh, for many people is not the language they use all the time. Uh, for some people it is, and you get an interesting mix in my, my uh, experience at Yiddish Vach of people at different levels of fluency and also whose uh, commitment to the language is different. I mean, some of them are people who, if they know you speak Yiddish, they will only speak Yiddish with you. They will not 
talk to you in English, even if you start talking to them in English or some other language. Um, and then there are people for whom this is a language that they enjoy, that they that they they use, but in a limited way. And uh, but here you have this immersive experience, and it's it's uh, it, it, it's quite remarkable. Even when you're doing uh, things that feel like ordinary summer activities, it's not ordinary because of the language. It's, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, we we associate uh, Yiddishists with being secular very often, except with the Katidim. But these uh, these some of, many of them have religious services in Yiddish world. Yes, so. no, it, it's um, uh, one of the things that is interesting to see at uh, uh, programs that bring people together around Yiddish is the wide range of what brings them to Yiddish and, and what other uh, aspects of Jewish life are, are, are uh, you know, part of, part of their uh, part, part of their experience. So you have very secular people and you have very religious people. You have, uh, for example, people who uh, are religious, but they want an egalitarian minion. They want women and men to worship together. And there are others who say, no, 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 we're Orthodox, we don't do that. And so they accommodate these, these groups go. And then of course, there are the people who don't daven, who don't, you know, they're very secular. They just don't go there. And, uh, and of course, you have a growing number of people who aren't Jews at all, but who are very interested in Yiddish and uh, uh, who are, are uh, drawn to it, not because it's a heritage, la heritage language, but it's a language that they're interested in uh, uh, as performers, as scholars, uh, uh, for a wide variety of reasons. And um, uh, that they become an increasingly important part of the mix. So there's a very uh, interesting question in the chat. Um, I think maybe that we can close with this one. Okay. Um, Sari wrote, hi, this is a very interesting presentation. Considering a timeline of Yiddish, uh, would you consider a specific period most important within it? And what antici anticipations might be there for Yiddish in an increasingly globalized communication environment? Oh boy, that's a really good question, or actually two questions. Um, you know, it's hard to know, um, you know, to pick a, an important period, but I would say that um, for, for people today, uh, what looms so large in uh, uh, their engagement with Yiddish as a contemporary language is looking at the, uh, uh, the period just before World War II, especially between the two war wars, when you had an unprecedented level of cultural activity internationally, you had the largest number of Yiddish speakers ever uh, estimated on the eve of, the, of World War II at 11 million speakers of Yiddish, uh, which would make it the most widely spoken Jewish language ever. And um, so that looms especially large, even though it's a very brief period and it's very different from what came before and very different what came afterwards, but it, it really looms especially large. I would say, you know, um, what, what is interesting to me is, is that at the same time, globalization is in encouraging uh, a, a kind of collapsing of linguistic diversity. Um, uh, there are growing numbers of people who want to learn uh, what uh, in the United States we call less commonly taught languages. And uh, Yiddish is on that list and they are drawn to it not because necessarily for instrumental reasons, but as an end in itself. One of the thing, ways I would track what's happening with Yiddish is most, most recent development is that uh, Duolingo, which is a, a language learning app uh, originally created to learn Spanish, uh, English speakers to learn Spanish, and then Spanish speakers to learn English, has created uh, a couple dozen language learning apps. And they recently, within the last few weeks, released one on Yiddish. And the last time I checked, there were uh, several hundred thousand users who had signed up for this. Now, how serious they're all going to be? Are they all going to attain fluency of the language? I mean, I, I, unlikely, but just the level of interest alone is quite remarkable. And uh, 
that to me is something to think about uh, for you know where Yiddish is going. Is that in a in a in a, a very globalized world, um, there are all kinds of reactions against the homogenization of globalization, and globalization also creates new opportunities for contact with people uh, so that, um, you know, Yiddish speakers uh, are now, uh, especially in this format that we're using right now, are in touch with one another globally in ways uh, uh, that they've never been before. So uh, these are things to watch uh, moving forward with uh, what's going to happen with Yiddish. I forgot yeah. to ask about the guy in Massachusetts that has this uh, a massive library of Yiddish. He's trying to ask people to donate uh, to him rather than put in Geniza. And has he made any kind of impact? Uh, yeah, so the Yiddish Book Center, uh, very quickly, because I know um, we're going to sign off soon, um, is located in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, it's been around since the early 1980s. And it was uh, set up to collect uh, Yiddish books so that people who couldn't find them could, could acquire them who wanted to have uh, you know, uh, Yiddish works of Yiddish literature and other books. They've collected an enormous number of books and they've expanded their uh, uh, efforts in a number of ways, including the teaching of Yiddish. And I've had several students who've gone there to the summer to study Yiddish. Uh, and uh, people, again, come from all over. Uh, to uh, to en engage with the language in different ways. They've recently published their own Yiddish language textbook, um, which is the other, I guess, big new, big recent development in in uh, 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 Yiddish pedagogy, uh, uh, at least here in the United States. And um, it's definitely created um, a, a, a greater awareness and interest in Yiddish uh, uh, widely. And um, uh, more narrowly, uh, encouraging people to learn the language as well, which is, uh, is, is quite wonderful to see. Thank you so, so much, Professor Shandler. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom and uh, Chag Sameach. Shavuot is coming. Thank you very much, Daron. Bleib mir alle gesund.